Jacobin in conjunction with YouGov. And the newly minted Center for Working Class Studies released a massive survey on the political views of working class Americans. It's big, ambitious, and as far as anyone can tell, the first of its kind. The reason for the study is that if you care about any sort of progressive change, whether it's an improved healthcare system or any redistribution of wealth or the reining in of the power of the rich or any of the good stuff that we want here at Jacobin, it will only happen if it comes from a base of power rooted in the working class. This isn't like a purely theoretical exercise. It is rooted in actual history. Think of any big reform that you could loosely define as progressive, whether it was the New Deal or civil rights or the eight hour workday or even the European welfare state or the National Health Service in the UK. In every instance, it was delivered by political parties whose base was in the working class. It isn't because the working class have any sort of moral or mystical qualities that make it special. It is because those reforms are in the working class's self-interest. If the base of power for your political party are bourgeois suburbanite homeowners, well, I'm sorry to say the issues that matter to them will be prioritized. And for the last few decades, for the last few decades, broadly speaking, since the dawn of the neoliberal era, left parties which were formerly rooted in the working class and delivered the great reforms of the 20th century have been bleeding working class voters and replacing them with more affluent, educated professionals. Here's what the authors of the study wrote in the introduction. In the last decade, as these trends have accelerated, it has also become clear that this class-based shift extends across racial groups. Between 2012 and 2020, the share of college-educated whites in the Democratic camp rose from 46 to 54 percent, while the share of whites without a college degree, already at a historic low, fell from 40 to 37 percent. Working class voters of color, meanwhile, mostly remain Democrats, but their recent shift away from the party has been just as pronounced. Republican support among non-white voters without degrees jumped from 16% in 2012 to 25% in 2020. Clearly, it is time for Democrats to reassess their approach to winning working class voters. In the most recent round of intra-party arguments after the 2020 election, both sides recognized the urgency of the problem, but came to diametrically opposed conclusions. On the one hand, centrists like Abigail Spanberger and James Clyburn slammed left-wingers for their ideological extremism, citing policies like defunding the police and Medicare for all as major electoral liabilities, especially with the working class. On the other side of the divide, progressive leaders like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Rashida Tlaib insist that the lack of, bold economic, of a bold economic message has hampered the party's ability to inspire working class enthusiasm. Now, Thomas Piketty, famous for his book, Capital in the 21st Century, studied this phenomenon, and it is remarkably consistent across different countries. Here's Simon Cooper in the Financial Times writing about Piketty's work. He writes, quote, Piketty has merged post-electoral uh, post surveys from 1948 to 2017 with data on voters' wealth, education, income, and so on. The story for each country is similar. The cultural elite, the cultural elite and the moneyed elite AKA the Brahmins and the merchants, as Piketty calls them, are both growing. Both have captured their chosen political parties. On left and right, politics is now an elite sport. The big change since 1948 is the educated elites shift left. The trend is virtually identical in the three countries, notes Piketty. In the US, for instance, from the 1940s to the 1960s, the more educated people were, the more they voted Republican. By 2016, the situation had reversed. 70% of voters with master's degree backed Hillary Clinton. British graduates moved left more slowly, but now mostly vote labor. He continues by pointing out that this phenomenon has essentially shut working class people out of politics. He writes, quote, the, under, the underprivileged watch helplessly, sidelined in politics as in most professions. No longer do non-graduates like Harry Truman or John Major lead governments. Even Italy's populist prime minister is a law professor who faced allegations that he embellished his educational CV. Today's politicians are elitist educated by Brahmins, meaning cultural elites, chastised by Brahmin commentators, <laughs> we know who they are, and funded by merchants. Piketty remarks, maybe unsurprisingly, the massive increase in abstention in all three countries between the 1950s, 60s and the 2000s, 2010s arose for the most part within lower education and lower income groups. Now, the fact that politics is an elite sport while the underprivileged watched helplessly is why our politics these days is all just culture war bullshit while the grand questions of wealth and power are largely just ignored. And while educational attainment is not an absolutely perfect synonym for class, 
is pretty close. And indeed, that was what the study used to filter working class voters in five different swing states here in America. And the results are very interesting. Unsurprisingly, working class voters reject candidates who focus on the hot button culture war issues at the expense of economic issues. This is the study's first key takeaway, quote, working class voters prefer progressive candidates who focus primarily on bread and butter economic issues and who frame those issues in universal terms. This is especially true outside deep blue parts of the country. Candidates who prioritize bread and butter issues, jobs, health care and the economy and who presented them in plain spoken universalist rhetoric performed significantly better than those who had other priorities or used other language. This general pattern was even more dramatic in rural and small town areas where Democrats have struggled in recent years. So the way the study worked is pretty unique. Typical polling is around issues like, say, do you support aggressive climate policy or not? Or do you support Medicare for all, et cetera? What this study did was create these rich candidate profiles where they told the participant a sample candidate's race, gender, professional background, issue priority, and political messaging style, and then pitted them against a different candidate and saw which one won out. So for example, they would put a, they would put a candidate who was an Asian female teacher whose top issue was healthcare and whose political messaging style was boldly progressive but woke and pitted her against a male black veteran whose top issue was the economy and whose messaging style was moderate but not woke. And they asked the respondent to choose. They did this thousands of times with thousands of different permutations. And now, crucially, the study filtered out hardline Republican partisans, and it only included working class people who were Democratic partisans, leaned Democrat, were independent, or leaned Republican. It also included people who just didn't vote at all. Now, the idea behind this was that Republican partisans are almost impossible to get. So what were some of the results? Well, for starters, it made absolutely no statistical difference whether the candidate was a man or a woman. It was 50-50 down the line. In terms of race, black candidates fared significantly better than candidates of other races, especially white candidates. The way to interpret these results is that if you're seeing the, the graphic that the, the right, the more farther right the little dot is, the higher support that category had, while the further left the dot is, the lower support, the vertical line represents the mean. So in this category, black is the furthest right, therefore most popular, and then Latino, then Asian, and finally white. In terms of top issues, the candidates who emphasized jobs, the economy, and healthcare did better than the mean, while candidates who emphasized racial justice and especially immigration as the top issue did way more poorly. When polled on specific issues, the results were interesting. And systemic racism polled very highly, for example, uh, as did Medicare for All, which I think would surprise a lot of people. So writing in The Nation, Catherine Rader, our guest and who was one of the authors uh, of the study, wrote, quote, while our respondents preferred candidates with a central focus on universal bread and butter issues, we found little evidence that racial resentment was driving these preferences. In fact, potentially Democratic working class voters were strong supporters of candidates who promised to, quote, end systemic racism, favoring them over rivals with a more general commitment to equal rights for all. To underscore this point, black female candidates were far and away the most popular candidates among our sample, including among white working class respondents. These results complicate the popular theory that the primary driver of white working class electoral behavior in recent elections is a latent or resurgent racism. The supposed racism of the American working class has obsessed liberal pundits since Trump became president in 2016. It is true that working class voters did flock to Trump in large numbers that year. And to liberals, that was evidence that these voters were just horribly racist. This study pours cold water on that narrative. Indeed, a lot of the working class Trump voters actually voted for Obama, a black man, twice. Eileen and Richard Sorokas have lived in Wilkes-Barre all their lives. They're registered Democrats and voted for President Barack Obama twice, even volunteered for the president's 2008 campaign near the height of the Great Recession. People are desperate to work and a lot of people going back on welfare and counting on the government. So people were struggling at that time for, you know, any type of work. At the end of President Obama's term, unemployment in Luzerne County had dropped to 5.9%. The Soroka said that's not good enough, and the high-paying jobs have not returned. So in 2016, they voted for Donald Trump. Just like Barack Obama was there, it was time for change. It was time for change again to have uh, Trump in there. A lot of their neighbors agree. In 2012, President Obama won Luzerne County by almost five points. 
In 2016, Donald Trump won the county, beating Hillary Clinton by 20 points. I believe you need that businessman. You got to yeah. get the politically correct things out of here and get a businessman, get this country straight out, get the yeah. deficit down yeah. and, and start getting jobs. So what happened there? Well, this study provides some possible insights. And to my mind, the most innovative part of the study is how they designed a candidate's political messaging style. It broke it, broke it down into five categories, woke progressive, woke moderate, mainstream moderate, populist progressive, and Republican. So what do these categories mean? Well, a woke progressive soundbite in the study would sound a lot like this. Good evening, bienvenidos, and thank you to everyone here today endeavoring towards a better, more just future for our country and our world. In fidelity and gratitude to a mass people's movement working to establish 21st century social, economic, and human rights, including guaranteed health care, higher education, living wages, and labor rights for all people in the United States. A movement striving to recognize and repair the wounds of racial injustice, colonization, misogyny, and homophobia, and to propose and build reimagined systems of immigration and foreign policy that turn away from the violence and xenophobia of our past. Now, in contrast to that, there would be the populist progressive. The populist progressive would have similar beliefs to the woke progressive, but they wouldn't use terms like colonization to describe their vision for transformational change. Here is what a populist progressive in the study might sound like. All over this country, workers are sick and tired of earning starvation wages. You can't make it on nine bucks an hour or 11 bucks an hour or 12 bucks an hour. We are going to raise the federal minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. We are going to provide equal pay for equal work for women. We are going to make it easier for workers to join unions. We're going to create millions of good paying union jobs by rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure and building the 10 million units of low income and affordable housing this country desperately needs. So again, those two candidates probably believe the same things. They're just delivering the message in a different package, so to speak. And now on the other side of the coin are the moderates, what we would call on this show corporate Democrats. They are also split into two messaging groups. They believe a lot of the same things, but they use different messaging to deliver them as well. On the one hand, you have the woke moderate, or what I would call the Joy Ann Reed moderate, which might sound something like this. Now, one of my favorite American icons, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, was, was once asked when there will be enough women on the Supreme Court, and she answered, when there are nine. Well, I, I think that's a goal to keep in mind and to be clear about it, to keep working with each other and supporting each other. Uh, Rachel Chavkin put it perfectly at the Tonys. This is not a pipeline issue. It is a failure of imagination by a field whose job is to imagine the way the world could be. <laughs> now, the other type of moderate is what they would call the mainstream moderate. Guys like James Carville or Joe Biden, or perhaps this guy who delivered one of the most famous mainstream moderate speeches in American history at the 2004 DNC. It is that fundamental belief, I am my brother's keeper, I am my sister's keeper, that makes this country work. It's what allows us to pursue our individual dreams and yet still come together as one American family. E pluribus unum. Out of many, one. Now, 
even as we speak, there are those who are preparing to divide us. The spin masters, the negative ad peddlers, who embrace the politics of anything goes. Well, I say to them tonight, there is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. There is not a black America and a white America and Latino America and Asian America. There's the United States of America. The pundits, the pundits like to slice and dice our country into red states and blue states, red states for Republicans, blue states for Democrats. But I've got news for them, too. We worship an awesome God in the blue states, and we don't like federal agents poking around in our libraries in the red states. So you see, he sounds like a populist, but he's not advocating for anything transformational. Now, the final category is the Republican style messaging, which I won't show you a video of, but you can imagine what it is. In the study, they use this example, quote, what makes America great is the freedom of the American people. But today, our freedom is under threat from radical socialists, arrogant liberals, and dangerous foreign influences. We need strong leaders in Washington to protect conservative values and defend the Constitution against those who want to destroy the greatest country in the world. This could have been in a stump speech by Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio. Now, the results comparing those messaging styles are very interesting. Here are Matt Carp and Dustin Guastella writing about the study in The Guardian. They write, quote, working class voters will not punish candidates for advocating for civil rights. But when Democrats frame this struggle in a way that overshadows their commitment to delivering bread and butter goods, and when they adopt an activist inspired identity based rhetoric, they are likely to lose working class votes. Our survey turned up some very large gaps on this front. A populist candidate with a central focus on the economy earned 63% support, for example, while moderates and woke progressives with a focus on immigration or racial justice won under 50%. The results were striking when you split the voters out by region. Now, it's not a particularly novel insight to say that Democrats struggle mightily in rural areas. Just look at any electoral map. It is a sea of red with tiny little blue spots in the cities. Well, you won't be surprised to learn that woke messaging does not does worse in rural areas than mainstream moderate messaging and way worse than populist progressive messaging. And to me, one of the more interesting areas of study were working class non-voters. Theoretically, we on the left see this group as the sort of sleeping giant of American politics, the group of people that can be that have checked out of the system but can be reactivated to transform our politics. This was one of the central pitches that Bernie had in his campaigns. Well, the study shows that woke language is poison amongst non-voters. The green dots represent non-voters and the furthest to the right, therefore the most successful type of messaging uh, amongst non-voters is the populist progressive Bernie Sanders style messaging. But the second most popular uh, message was the Republican one. The woke messaging, especially the Joy Ann Reed, Hillary Clinton style of woke moderation is absolute poison. And when you break down the respondents by race, here is how the authors describe the results. While much of the literature has focused on the significance of identity and representation for voters of color, our study adds significantly to an understanding of substantive issues that resonate with voters across racial groups. Black, white, and Latino respondents all viewed progressive policies such as ending systemic racism and Medicare for all positively. The whites were less supportive than other groups in both cases. Black respondents were the most supportive of both priorities. Black respondents were also the most supportive of racial justice as the day one priority for candidates, while whites viewed this priority negatively overall. Two other notable findings were that black respondents had the most favorable view of a jobs guarantee and Latino respondents had the most favorable view of cutting government spending. Overall, non-woke candidates fared better than woke candidates among whites who were equally positive toward progressive populist and mainstream moderate messaging. By contrast, blacks were roughly equal in their support for all Democratic candidates. Latino respondents were the most supportive of mainstream moderate rhetoric, rhetoric the least supportive of woke progressive messaging, and had similar levels of support for woke, centrist, and progressive populist rhetoric. Now, the results are interesting, but should not surprise us. We have talked about this a lot on this show and on the Jackman Show on Wednesdays, that a lot of the rhetoric that has become, if not popular, obligatory amongst college-educated progressives who are overrepresented in political campaigns and political media vis-a-vis -vis the broader population is alienating to large swaths of non-educated working-class people. Hopefully, we will see more studies of this kind in the future, because in order to challenge capital, 
We need a working class that is conscious of itself and organized into a coherent politics. In order to do that, politicians and organizers must appeal to their self-interest in a manner which is not alienating to them. Sean McElwee is wrong when he says that the affluent suburbs of our cities are the base for progressive change. The results in Virginia last week showed just how fickle those suburbanites are when they don't get to vote against Donald Trump. They very quickly abandoned that veneer of progressivism. If we are to have any sort of positive change, it will come from the working class. And studies like this can be a powerful tool for politicians and organizers who are serious about activating those working class people. All right, and we're going to have uh, Katie Rader on a little later to um, help us further unpack uh, the results. But Nando, it is really nice to have a data set available to kind of reinforce something that we've been talking about um, quite a bit on this show for a long time. Um, and progressives in Congress would, you know, definitely benefit from actually paying attention to this kind of data instead of kind of getting sucked into the failed messaging that we've been seeing from the Democratic Party. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I mean, uh, you know, a lot a lot of it has to do with just the, the type of people who um, are like work for their campaigns or, or become activists, you know, in in whatever cause like, you know, environmental justice or you know, racial justice or whatever. The, the, the vast majority of, of people who comprise those organizations are usually college educated and usually um, you know, went to some liberal arts school like I did, like, you know, like that where you're just around a different milieu and adopt a different kind of um, language usage that um, is just completely alienated to regular people out in the world. I mean, it's just, just the reality of it. I mean, like if you go out in the world and you don't see that there's a backlash to that kind of rhetoric, I mean, I, mean, I don't know what to tell you. Like, it's just it's it's as obvious as, as it can be. And this study just kind of reinforces that uh, narrative with uh, with numbers. If you enjoyed this video from Jacobin Weekends, please hit like and subscribe. That way, you'll enjoy all of our backlog, as well as all of our future content, including interviews, live streams, and clips. Thank you.